Okay, so a very good morning and uh, welcome to our lovely Environmental Justice Conference 2019, Transformative Connections. This is kind of, uh, I see it as um, the latest in a, in a highly informal series of Environmental ju Justice Conferences, the last one of which was in Sydney about 18 months ago. Very nice to see David here. And before that, we had one in uh, Colorado. Uh, great to see Demetrius here as well. And I think before that, there was one in, in Barcelona. So we're, we're, we're probably might maybe calling this EJ4 or something like that. And I'm partly saying that because probably the informality will continue. And if anyone's thinking out there, we should be next. You've got a few days to uh, think about it talk to us. Um, welcome firstly to University of East Anglia and to, we're not actually in it at the moment, but the School of International Development, which is where the organisers of this conference are based. UEA is a fairly new university, as many of you will know, uh, born in uh, the mid-1960s um, and, and very quickly taking on sort of quite a progressive role with regards to environmental studies the School of Environmental Sciences began in the, the late 60s. Um, the Climate Research Unit, still extremely influential, began in the early 70s. 1973, the School of International <laughs> Development began. And interestingly, you know, that's where we are. And the School of International Development has been through some sort of key moments, I think, in, in its uh, history of sort of imagining, if you like, environmentalism from the perspective of development and global issues. Uh, one, I mean, just to mention a couple, because there are many along the way, but one of them would be um, the work of, of Piers Blakey, such as his 1985 work on the political economy of soil erosion, which obviously became a sort of seminal work in terms of the birth of the discipline of political ecology. Um, and then fast forwarding a long way, a, a colleague who several of us here worked with quite closely, Thomas Secor, um, influenced of course by the sort of the global scholarship, particularly from the US I guess on environmental justice, sort of injected again from a sort of international development perspective um, the environmental justice into the political ecology we were doing here. Uh, and he formed the, in sort of 2010, the Global Environmental Justice Research Group. And if we're to put in a nutshell what the kind of mission of those of us involved in that has been, it's to try and ensure that environmental justice analysis has been at the heart of environmental governance and trying to sort of push research and practice towards that. So that we're always asking with regards to environmental governance, who are the winners, who are the losers, and more importantly, perhaps, why? What are the underlying discriminations which lead to that and the powers associated with it? Um, yeah, so, so welcome to DEV, as we call it, and to UEA. Uh, I wanted, as I, I probably just about have time, a little sort of uh, historical anecdote about where we are in, in the country as well, in the UK, about Norwich and the county of Norfolk, and to welcome you here with a, a rather uh, interesting, but I mean, not a terribly happy ending kind of story. Um, but ab about this time of year, um, 470 years ago, so back in 1549, um, there was the beginning, it was July the 8th actually, it was the beginning of what's known as the, the Ketz Rebellion. Um, and a guy that, what was happening at the time was that, you know, Norwich was the second most important city in the country, we're told, after, after London, and a lot of its wealth was based on trade in wool. And the elite were starting to enclose the commons, fencing off the land in order to be able to have more sheep themselves and to make more money. So the commoners were being dispossessed. And in a town up the road called Wyndham, um, the commoners were starting to get upset about this and were starting to protest. So on July the 8th, 1549, they started tearing down the fences. And they got to the, a landowner called Robert Ketzland and were tearing down his fence 
And Ket said, well, what are you doing? Explain to me. They explained to him, and he said, well, actually, I agree with you. Um, so, so there was this sort of middle class, not a huge, but a middle class landowner who became the leader of the commoners, and they marched from Wyndham to Norwich, demanding to be heard, demanding to negotiate to have some of the commons reinstated. Norwich, a walled city at the time, well, still is, but the walls are a bit crumbly, um, said no, shut the gates. They set up camp in Mousehold Heath, um, still a nice place to go and walk your dog or whatever these days, and their numbers grew until there were, I think, nearly 16,000 commoners there. So they took Norwich by force. They held Norwich. They set up their own tribunal. They met under the, the transformation oak tree in Mousehold Heath. And commoners... ...jail. It went on for a few weeks, but of course it was a major threat to the crown. So the king sent an army. The army was defeated. The king sent a bigger army. And eventually Robert Kett was defeated. They strung him up by chains from the castle in the town. Some of you, I hope, will see that. Um, left him to slowly starve to death, chained to the wall, and then left him for a few months more to rot in full, full public view to say, if you're an environmental justice campaigner and you come to Norwich, <laughs> seeking to reinstate the commons, this, this is the danger. But of course, uh, <laughs> we welcome people <laughs> rather more kindly these days. Uh, and whilst we're, we're lucky enough not to face that kind of uh, treatment here, uh, we should, of course, acknowledge that um, you know, around the world these days there are still defenders of the commons, defenders of environmental justice, who are risking everything to try and prevent loss of the commons. Talking of sort of better welcome these days, um, I mean, this year we, we have seen you know, something of, of a, perhaps a slightly sort of unpredicted growth in the movement and in protest. We've seen, in particular, school children going on strike, um, protesting in the centre of town here, and I mean, not just here, of course, but, but worldwide. We've seen the, the, the rapid and to some sort of quite surprising growth of Extinction Rebellion, and both groups, you know, calling for politicians and others to, to say that, yes, we do indeed have a climate and an ecological emergency. Um, and those school ch children are, are supported by parents, by the school. Nobody's uh, saying this is the wrong thing to do anymore. Um, it's interesting that uh, I think for some, um, and, and I, I feel a bit nervous about it myself, declaring an emergency is a sort of slightly problematic way of going around things. You know, some historically, of course, um, for a state, as our government voted for on the 1st of May this year, for a state to, to declare an environmental emergency or climate emergency is not something which premises better democ democracy often. You know, declaring emergency tends to be a sort of premise for states to work in rather more authoritarian ways. So there is some concern about how that happens. But, but nevertheless, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for school children to be saying we're worried about, you know, what happens to our generation and next generation. And actually to, you know, if we think of the, diff, the main sort of pillars of justice, that concern for future generations, that absolute sort of fundamental requirement that the current generation has an obligation to leave sufficient options to the next generation it is, is foundational to environmental justice. But still... You know, having sort of um, accepted that the, how essential that sort of intergenerational justice is, there's still a role for 
our community, a massive role for our community, to ask, as we did in our group and so many others have asked before us, you know, who are the winners and the losers of this within the current generation? So, you know, the other great pillar of justice for us is not, is not about future generations, but about our generation and who's winning and who's losing and why, and how we can have declare an emergency, how we can have transformative change to resolve that, but for it to be just, a just transition, a just transformation, and that's a big role for us here. And I think I should say in passing, actually, that there's, of course, there's a, a third pillar, perhaps, of this environmental justice, which is our obligation to, to non-humans as well, if we're good to try and be a bit more complete. Um, so, so, in a sense, that, that's why I think we're, it's very timely that we're having this conference now, that we're trying to focus a bit on this sort of sense that there needs to be radical, rapid, probably non-linear change. Sometimes it will surprise us, but that we have to always have this sense that we just can't be responding to an emergency in the sense that we, we must overlook the ecological and social democracy which is essential to us. So I'm hugely looking forward to this conference. Um, so nice to see all of you here, here to share your uh, time and your energy and your, your ideas with us. And, and that's the great thing about this event. And my, and my great hope is, is not that, you know, just that we sort of stay, you know, particularly very focused on particular themes or whatever. We all come with different research and practice experiences. But the great hope is just that we do this in, in, in a spirit of sharing, of intellectual generosity, in comradeship, and so on. So a very big welcome, and thank you for coming. <laughs> I, I'm going to hand over now to many of you will have um, been in contact in some respects with Hannah Gray. And of course, uh, when it comes to organizing this event, uh, I'm standing here first, but I take no credit whatsoever for this. H Hannah is the one who has <laughs> really been the, uh, the power behind this. So thank you very much. I didn't I'll talk about this. Is that right? You certainly may. Yeah. OK, hello, everyone. So you can put a face to the name that you've seen on all the emails coming round. Um, it's lovely to meet you all, and I hope to be able to meet each of you individually over the next three days. Um, so I'm the coordinator of the Global Environmental Justice Group here at UEA, and I'm going to talk to you just for five or six minutes about some logistics for the event. Okay. So the boring bit's out the way first. Um, there's no fire alarms planned today. There were a few earlier on this morning, but no more plans. So if you hear the alarm, please follow one of the green signs and exit the building. And there's one down there if you're in this room. Um, there's no assembly point for this building, so you just need to go somewhere away from the building and find someone in a purple T-shirt. Okay? Um, you may have found the toilets already, um, but there's some either side as you go out the stairs into the main foyer and also upstairs as well. Um, there's a number of drinking water fountains around, so I see lo lots of you have bought your bottles, which is great. Um, please make the most of the drinking water fountains and keep hydrated. Um, and just a reminder, I said in the joining instructions that there's no charging points in this building. Um, so if you, your devices start running low, please charge them up overnight in your accommodation and bring them fully charged in the morning. Okay, so in your program, booklets, you should have all received one of the programs. Um, so one of these, which summarizes all the sessions, what's happening when, which rooms, who's talking when. So this is your summary. Um, but if you want to download the full abstract book, um, you need to go to our website to do that. Um, so you can go to that link, scan the QR code, or it's also on page two of your program down the bottom there. 
if you want to view all the abstracts. lecture theatre for today and tomorrow. Um, so if you want to share with your friends and colleagues who couldn't make it actually to the, to the conference, but they might want to watch online, um, then they need to go to YouTube and search for Dev School UEA. And um, we have retweeted that link as well today on our Twitter account, so you can share that. And the talks will be available after the conference on there as well. Um, and if you want to join the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag EJ. 2019. And we're going to be using Slido in here. Um, some of you will, be, will have used this before. Um, it's a way, it's a website to collate questions um, for speakers. Um, so in here, Tina, who's sitting at the front with the laptop, is going to be coordinating questions. So if you've got a mobile device on you, it's really easy. You just go to slido.com in your browser. And then you enter our code, which is the same, EJ2019. And then you'll be able to see all the questions that people are submitting for the presenters. You'll be able to like particular questions. And Tina will be collating those results and um, talking to the chair of the session. So that that's a way that people who aren't here, but they might be watching online, they can get involved in the conversation as well. Okay, so the parallel sessions, um, there'll always be some sessions happening in this main lecture theatre, but after our plenary session this morning, we'll be breaking up into our different rooms. So one of the rooms is up the stairs to your left when you go out of here and round the corner, and the other three rooms are as you go up out of here to the left down the corridor that runs along this side of the building. Um, there'll be student helpers in each of the rooms to help you with your presentations if you're speaking um, to get loaded up. Um, and we're all wearing these lovely glamorous purple t-shirts. So if you have any questions about anything, the venue or how to get around UEA campus, um, history of Norwich, we might be able to help you with some of those things. Okay, so the conference dinner, if you've got a ticket for the dinner tonight, um, it's happening in the Sainsbury Centre, which is on the UEA campus, but at the other end from where we are now. So it's about a five, ten minute walk away. Um, so leave enough time for that. And we're going to be finishing off in this venue about half past five. Um, so you've got a bit of time to go back to your room if you're staying on campus um, before we congregate in the cafe at seven o'clock. Um, but we also have the opportunity to look around the art galleries, which are in the Sainsbury Centre beforehand. If you'd like to do that, they'll be open to conference delegates between six and seven o'clock. Um, so you can just turn up whenever you like and have a look around before we eat. Okay, so the last thing to say is in your um, conference booklets, you should have um, some of these postcards. There should be three in each of yours. Um, and these are going to be used in the, hopefully on the learning wall, which we've got set up in the foyer. You might have noticed it when you were getting tea and coffee earlier. Um, so the lovely Debbie, who's over there, give us a wave, Debbie. Debbie's our graphic recorder for the conference, and she's going to be recording the keynote speaker's talks on the board there. Um, but she's also going to be helping us with our learning wall in the foyer. Um, so we want to try and um, gather some of the wisdom that we have in the room about how people have transformed environmental justice situations, whether that's something you've had personal experience of or somebody you've worked alongside. If you have an, a story or an experience of a transformation in environmental justice that you'd like to share with the delegates, then please use these postcards to do that. You can use words or you can use pictures, and then we're going to post them up on the learning wall. And that would be kind of a, <coughs> a communal way to share some of the knowledge that we have in this room. If you want to put your name as well, then it might be that someone else who's here reads your story and thinks, I need to connect with that person and share. Um, so it would be great if you feel you could put your name, and hopefully we can start some conversations amongst ourselves and inspire each other. Madhu is a fellow of the Rights and Resources Initiative in India who has been working on forest tenure reform in India for over 16 years. She has played a key role as a member of the Campaign for Survival and Dignity in India, which successfully secured the Forest Rights Act in 2006 and was instrumental in drafting this act. 
This is a breakthrough legislation which recognizes the individual and community forest rights of over 200 million indigenous and other citizens living in and around forests in India. She, active, she was actively involved in the campaign for survival and dignity in mobilizing communities for claiming and asserting their rights under this act. <coughs> Her primary focus for almost four decades has been on gender just and equity sensitive community empowerment and democratizing natural resource governance. Madhu also has a long-standing collaboration with various of our researchers from DEF, including Oliver springate Baginski, and has co-authored many papers top and topics including poverty alleviation and natural resource management. Because of her important contribution, contributions to just forest management in India, both at the grassroots level and policy analysis level, Madhu was nominated this year for an honorary degree at UEA. As many of you probably know, honorary degrees are awarded annually to acknowledge individuals for outstanding accomplishments in their field and for exceptional contributions to the community. We're very happy to say that Madhu will be receiving an honorary degree, a uh, doctorate of civil law uh, in our Dev graduation ceremony in July this month, next Wednesday or two, two weeks 17th. from now, the 17th. And so we're very, very fortunate to have her today to share with us her work and experience in forest uh, tenure rights in India. She will be talking to us um, about this experience and the title of her presentation is A Transformative Movement for Restoring Justice in the Forests, the India's Forest Rights Act. Before she starts, we have asked our speakers for today and for tomorrow just to share with us some more personal aspects of their life, not only their academic life so that you get to know them on a more personal level. So we've asked them to come prepared to share some very, very basic questions that have nothing to do with academia. Um, but are mundane and day-to-day. -day. The first one is, if you, if you could please tell us which is your favorite food, um, which is your favorite place in the world, something you like to do when you're not doing academic work or activism, and one thing that really riles you, that really makes you sort of angry and frustrated, and the most important current environmental justice issue from your perspective. You mind sharing that with us first, and then we can let you start with your 25-minute presentation. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be just going signaling like this when there's five minutes left before you finish. Thank you. I'm the other thing for both of you. The questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll say them again. Favorite food, mm. favorite place, what you like doing where you're not doing academic work or, or activism, what riles you the most, and the most important current environmental justice issue from your perspective. For both of you, if we could ask you to stay around this area, don't come to the front of the screen because your head will appear in the, in the film, in the, in the filming thing. So just around here, okay? Are you going to give me that? Yes, I need to give you, which way, this one? And then we need to switch it back again. Or should I go, do you want what, what are you more? Different. Okay. 
Rude. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me start with my personal hang-ups. <laughs> food, I, I basically love all local foods. I love experimenting. I, wherever I go, I want to check what local foods there are. Uh, the only thing is I'm a vegetarian, so no meats. <laughs> um, what is the second one? Place, place, well, I don't have any particular favorite place. I mean, I enjoy being in the mountains, I like being out, but I'm equally happy sitting at home. <laughs> so, uh, you like to be when you're not working? My dogs. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I love playing with my dogs and pampering them. That's my favorite pastime at home. And riles you? Riles you, my God, riles me. I, I think it's the dreadful politics at the moment, both in our country and in many others. And the last one? I think the, the most important issue is how to mainstream environmental justice. It's, it's just absent, you know, it's not discussed in anything to do with the environment, at least in our country. So how to actually make it a key dimension of all conservation and forest, uh, you know, protection, etc. movement. So that's what it is. So I'll begin now. So I have my 25 minutes from now. I'll try and keep an eye. Um, Okay, so I'm basically going to share with you our experience in India of, I think, um, it's the first act we've managed to get which overturns the colonial Indian Forest Act, which took over uh, basically Indian customary lands as state forests. Uh, just to give a quick thing about the Indian context, it almost a quarter of the country's land area um, has been classified as forest. And over the years with you know, the focus on environmental protection or forest conservation, the rules and acts have become more and more stringent. Um, but a lot of these lands have actually been uh, customary landscapes of common lands of communities which have, you know, initially the British took them over, mainly for timber, and after independence, the Indian government has continued appropriating these commons and classifying them as state forests and depriving people of major, uh, you know, livelihood rights, uh, as well as cultural rights. A lot of, you know, communities have very strong cultural uh, links with their forests. The other thing, as I just said, is that you know, environmental justice does not figure in the dominant discourse on environment conservation in India, so which labels and which ends up labeling uh, forest dwellers as a threat rather than major stakeholders in uh, both forest and environmental conservations. So the result of this whole thing is that hundreds and thousands, if not millions of people have been classified as encroachers on their own lands, their own customary habitats uh, due to non-recognition of their rights. Now, as far as our particular movement for the Forest Rights Act is concerned, you know, any movement has to have some trigger or genesis. And I think in, in our case, it was with, uh, in fact, actually even the Supreme Court of India going, you know, blasé in empowering the forest department to supposedly protect Indian forests, that, you know, the forest department was given more and more powers. And uh, in 2002, the Environment Ministry issued an order saying evict all forest encroachers in the country, which would be hundreds and thousands of the most marginalized people, 
uh, within a few months. And, uh, you know, during that period, people were ev evicted from 152,000 hectares that we calculated that is roughly three quarters of a million people who were brutally evicted. Now this led, of course, to a massive outrage across the country. Uh, there were street protests in many different states and these different movements from different states started coming together at the national level to uh, you know, figure out how to deal with this. One, of course, was stop evictions. Uh, but then other questions came up, like why of the evictions? So that led to the birth of our campaign for survival and dignity, which is basically an informal umbrella platform of activists, academics, professionals, uh, all of whom came together, together with the grassroots movements to fight for justice in the forest and demanding uh, the right to live with dignity for our forest dwellers. Typical campaign strategies, there were street protests all over the country in many, many states where <coughs> evictions were taking place. There were demonstrations, public hearings, where people came and shared the atrocities being committed on them by forest department officials. Uh, in Maharashtra, they had what they called jail bharo campaign. Jail bharo meaning enter, fill the prisons campaign, like you, know, you stop all this injustice on forest dwellers. Then the, this was combined with engaging uh, members of parliament, members of state legislative assemblies, political parties, state governments, the prime minister's office, the media. Media was very important. Um, opinion makers, academics. So uh, for the first time, I think, in the history of, uh, in Indian history, this whole issue of forest rights became a national issue. There had always been, there's a long history of protest movements in different states against the colonial government, even post-independence. But this was the first time that across the country, you know, this became a national issue. And it also happened to be a period when the national elections were due. So uh, it became an election issue and many political parties started saying, uh, you know, that if they come to power, they will stop evictions and they will deal with these issues. Uh, as we moved on this, you know, there was a lot of analysis of what exactly was going on. And I will just quickly share the fact that, you know, if you really look at how all these forest lands have been assembled, there, you know, there is terrible, totally poor unaccountable procedures, unsound premises for classifying land as forest. I mean, there are, you know, snow covered peaks where not a blade of grass can grow. That's been classified as reserve forest. Uh, there are grasslands, you know, extremely uh, biodiversity rich landscapes, but they are not forests, you know, but handed over to the forest department, the department has been bunging uh, trees into them and actually destroying those. Uh, but this was basically, we realized that this was, a lot of it was misclassification of multifunctional customary communal lands as forests. There were serious uh, tenurial and land use conflicts all over the country, unclear boundaries, jurisdictional disputes uh, between uh, you know, land records are in a total mess. So there's the forest department, there's the revenue department. One says, this is forest land. The other says, no, this is revenue land. So they are fighting uh, amongst each other with people in the middle. And because of that, you have, with the, because of these lands being classified as forest, you have totally <coughs> inappropriate uh, imposition of management objectives on uh, customary lands by the forest department. Uh, the other big thing which came out was that something like 60% of the so-called Indian forests are actually constitutionally protected. Uh, in India, we use the term tribal. I know in many countries that's considered a bit derogatory. The real term is 
The Hindi term is Adivasi, which means indigenous inhabitant. So these are actually lands constitutionally protected for the indigenous communities. And instead of protecting their rights, the most kind of uh, horrific uh, you know, laws empowering the forest department to kick them around and you know, snatch their rights have been imposed on these lands by notifying them as state forests. Uh, what we discovered was that actually the biggest encroacher is the state itself while you know, threatening, wanting to evict uh, the local people as encroachers. Uh, and because of the non-recognition of the rights of indigenous uh, Adivasi communities, there's been massive displacement um, without any rehabilitation. So many of them end up going and settling in, you know, in other forest lands, where again they become encroachers, again they are uh, threatened with eviction. And uh, of course in all this, it's the uh, women who are the worst uh, sufferers. Now, this was by no means, uh, you know, an easy uh, campaign or movement. There were huge, uh, you know, factors. In fact, in the beginning, we had a lot of support. Uh, it was a very good period. In fact, we were very lucky uh, because it was a particular window in the political history of India when we had a coalition government, which was somewhat weak, had a strong presence of the left parties in it who were very supportive uh, for recognition of forest rights. And that's partly why, why we managed to get this. But the moment the, uh, the forest bureaucracy found out that such a you know, effort was on, the biggest uh, resistance, the strongest resistance to you know, the, the campaign to have such a, such a law to recognize uh, forest rights came from the forest bureaucracy because they saw it as a huge threat to their power and control. The other thing was the wildlife conservationists. You know, a lot of them are urban elite people who actually have set up uh, tiger safaris, you know, minting money out of uh, tiger reserves and all that. And they said, oh, no, 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 if you recognize rights of these people, it will mean the end of all the tigers. You know, they, they converted it into a tiger versus tribal debate that uh, such a law will result in destruction of all forests, all forest land will be distributed amongst all the Adivasis of the country, and so this law should not be permitted. And then be from behind the scenes, there were all the uh, you know, corporate interest because the forest, we perceive of the forest as forests, you know, but forests actually uh, have land, they have minerals underneath, they have other uh, opportunities and all the corporate interests are interested in forests from those angles, like, and they did not want rights recognized because that would make it a lot more difficult for them. Um, so, Anyway, we managed to get uh, the Forest Rights Act enacted in December 2006. So the unique characteristics of the act are firstly that it, in its preamble, it acknowledges the historical injustice done to uh, indigenous communities, forest dwelling communities, both indigenous and non-tribal, uh, due to their pre-existing rights not having been uh, recognized in the assemblage of so-called state forests. So it's not a benevolent granting of rights, but recognition of pre-existing rights. It also, in a sense, indirectly reclassifies what have been labeled as national forests back as community resources. You know, so there's a very strong uh, right recognized as right over community forest resources where communities are empowered to protect, conserve, and manage their forests. It provides for equal gender rights because all titles have to be in the names of both the spouses. 
uh, and in the case of communities, all adults. And the other thing was that because the majority of so-called forest lands are actually constitutionally protected uh, Adivasi lands, uh, we got the Ministry of Tribal Affairs to be the nodal ministry for this act and not the Ministry of Environment and Forest. In fact, when this matter was discussed in the Prime Minister's office, many of the senior uh, uh, government officials said that yes, such a law is very badly needed, but if you, uh, if you make the forest ministry responsible, then it will never be implemented because you know it's like asking a land landlord to hand over their land to others. So the Ministry of Tribal Affairs is the nodal ministry. So at least we now have another ministry dealing with rights on forest. Uh, there's a very strong emphasis on democratizing forest governance through the Forest Rights Act, rights to include responsibilities and authority for s sustainable use etc. to strengthen the conservation regime while ensuring livelihood and food security. And I think one of the most important uh, dimensions of the uh, Forest Rights Act is that it is not any government official or a committee of officials, but it is the village assembly, you know, in an open village assembly where rights uh, claims are submitted and have to be approved. So it's a very open democratic process uh, with uh, no, no meeting of the village assembly is considered valid unless it has at least 50% quorum and at least one third of those present have to be women. So there is uh, all that. Then uh, we have a whole range of rights uh, which the Forest Rights Act recognizes. I will not go into <coughs> too many of the details, but I think uh, in addition to household rights, which is rights to titles over land actually under cultivation or on which people are actually living before a particular cutoff date so that they get security of tenure uh, and get entitled to official benefits. Uh, but the most important right is the community forest resource right which effectively transfers the authority and power to protect, conserve, and manage those customary community forests to the community from the forest department. And this has actually initiated a process. I mean, this is beginning to happen in some parts of the country where communities are taking over forest management and doing, uh, uh, you know, quite very interesting and exceptional kind of things with that. Then there's uh, rights to own all non-timber forest products, etc., etc. And uh, the FRA also recognizes rights within all protected areas, wildlife sanctuaries, <coughs> tiger reserves, etc. And there is a provision to relocate only from these areas, only if it can be established that their continued residence there will lead to irreparable damage to uh, a particular area. Then, uh, as I said, you know, there's an equal uh, emphasis on women's rights, uh, titles in names of both spouses, community rights in names of all resident adults, one third women's representation in uh, all implementation one third women presence to complete the quorum. So in, in many respects, it is actually the largest forest tenure and governance reform in the country. We did, we've done a, a rough estimate that, you know, out of I think about 75 or 77 million hectares, which have been classified as forest lands in the country, uh, under the Forest Rights Act, rights can be recognized over 40 million hectares at least. Uh, that's more than half of the total forest <coughs> area. And as of March 2019, uh, rights have been recognized over <coughs> almost 18% of this potential area. That's about 7 million hectares all combined. 
uh, there is at least 150 million, maybe 200 or 250 million, you know, we can't, we don't have an accurate estimate of people who stand to benefit from this recognition of rights and of course it will secure livelihoods and etc. So as I said, at the household and community level, these rights have been recognized over more than 7 million hectares and about 1.9 million households. So if you multiply that by five, that would mean about 10 million people have got secure tenure over the land which they are either cultivating or living on. Uh, then uh, the FRA also integrates environmental justice in its provisions. Uh, you know, in India, there is, we have a Forest Conservation Act under which till before the FRA, there was a committee in, in sitting in Delhi which approves uh, what is called diversion of forest land, you know, say for a dam or a mine or to basically gives permission to destroy forests for other uses. The local communities never ever had any say in that. Uh, but now, uh, in fact, the environment ministry itself has issued an order that no, uh, that no diversion can take place without all the rights under the FRA being recognized in the area, the local community being informed about what the diversion is for, and seeking their informed consent. Now, this has actually become a big, big issue with all the corporates getting very uptight because it's really holding up a lot of their, uh, you know, grabbing of excellent pristine forest for mining, etc. Uh, then there can be no eviction till uh, rights recognition process has been completed. Uh, and as I said, the local communities have now a say and they can stop the destruction of their sacred forests, etc. There's several cases have landed up in courts. This is a picture of, it's an ongoing, right now this is going on, a huge protest where there's a proposal to uh, allocate the sacred forests of this tribal community for mining. And it's pristine forests and they, you know, it's the, they, they say it's the, uh, habitat of their goddess. And so they are up in arms and hopefully they'll be able to uh, stop it. Just another example of another, in a, another tiger reserve where community forest rights have been recognized. And the number of tigers have actually doubled. They say you've got to get rid of people because they are a threat to tigers. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Then we have this very famous case where actually the Supreme Court held that only the tribal community, another sacred forest of the Niamgiri Hills, uh, could decide whether it could be allocated for mining and it was stopped. Uh, another case of huge grasslands classified as forest uh, and the people have fought against it. You, you're getting all this governance and management of community forest resources. Now what, in terms of just quick look at what are the continuing challenges and new emerging threats. Uh, one is that implementation has been very uneven across the states, across and within states. Uh, there's been poor uh, empowerment of communities through awareness and information about the act, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, the forest department continues to be the biggest obstacle everywhere they are trying to uh, reject claims even when they don't have the legal authority to do so. And uh, one other thing is that, um, you know, this thing of seeking the prior informed consent of communities before diverting land for forest destruction, I would say, um, it is amazing the extent to which the government itself is coming out with fraudulent resolutions of consent. So that provision is being violated through fraudulent uh, epic 
resolutions. Uh, and also there is an effort in most uh, uh, mining areas, they're not recognizing the rights. Now this I won't go too much into details, but I think one of the biggest threats now, as we see, uh, because the government, I think if they could, they would happily have liked to dilute or annul the act because it's becoming a pain in the neck for so-called economic growth. Uh, but uh, since they can't do that because it will lead to a massive uh, public backlash, so they're coming out with all kinds of contradictory laws and policies which, which counter or in fact override the Forest Rights Act. And I think one of the worst out of these is a proposed amendment to the Colonial Indian Forest mm -hmm. Act of 1927. One would have thought that in 2019 it would be more democratic and more progressive, but this act actually empowers this um, proposed amendment, it's not yet been uh, enacted, empowers forest officials to shoot and kill in the name of forest protection. And then they are protected against penal action. Uh, so there is a lot of that. There's a new forest policy which totally ignores the Forest Rights Act. There are a lot of other things. Um, just a very quick uh, thing. I think one of the latest things which, which is very uh, disturbing is that uh, a number of wildlife organizations had gone to the Supreme Court of India challenging the constitutional validity of the act. Now this came up uh, for hearing in February and due to various reasons, partly because government of India was very poor in defending the act, the court ordered the eviction of 1.7 million claimants whose rights have been rejected, when actually it is known that a lot of these rejections have been done, not been done as per due process. Although the eviction has been stopped for the time being, but it is, uh, you know, it is distressing and disturbing because it, you know, an emancipatory law has such an order from the highest court of the country. So we have, uh, we've had again, massive uh, protests all over the country. Um, anyway, this is the way I see we moving ahead. It's been a huge milestone. It's become a weapon in the hands of forest dwellers. Um, it's, uh, and you know, the battle has to continue. It's by no means at its end. Thank you. Um, uh, David is a professor of environmental politics in the Department of Government and International Relations and co-director of the Sydney Environment Institute at the University of Sydney. He is known internationally for his work on environmental politics, environmental movements, and political theory, and in particular for the intersection in this three work in the work uh, in this three lines of work. Uh, in environmental justice. Most of us here know David for his contribution towards a plural approach for uh, researching and understanding environmental justice struggles. Um, he has drawn into Aris Young and Nancy Fraser's Three Dimensions of Justice, um, which has helped many of us understand the complexity of um, environmental justice struggles by bringing in the distributive, participatory, and recognition dimensions. He's been working also adding the capabilities approach to environmental justice uh, with different angles, but currently uh, his main research interests are in um, this relationship between environmental and climate justice issues, climate adaptation and resilience, environmental movements and the practices of everyday lives, what he has termed sustainable materialism, which is probably a newer term for many of us. And uh, he's writing about this in his forthcoming book, called Sustainable Materialism. And his presentation today, I imagine, will be drawing on this, focusing on the concept <laughs> of, of materialistic participation. Um, so before he does that, we'll also ask you to share with us your five little questions to, to get to know you in a different dimension that sure. doesn't come across in your books. Yeah. So favorite food, favorite place, 
what you like to do when you're not working, what really drives you, and from your perspective, the most important current environmental justice issue. Oh, okay. You have your microphone? Yeah. Can I, do you can want I this get, one? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. So um, one of the things I really like is, and this is similar, is, is taste. I like to know the, the local taste. So you get to know a place by the, the local flavors. And, and one of the ways of doing this is gin and botanicals. So had some good stuff last night. Um, uh, sorry, favorite place? Uh, probably anywhere near water. I've always liked to go to the beach and turn my back on everything and just look at the ocean. I still do that um, quite a bit at Sydney. Uh, what I like to do, I'm really boring. I like to hang out with my family. Uh, so do plenty of that. And that also entails both the gin and the ocean. So there's some connections there. Uh, what really riles me is uh, the politics of hate. Uh, there's, that's, that's the reason I left the US, why I no longer live in the US. Uh, is politics based on hatred. Uh, and the most important environmental justice issue, uh, straightforward for me, it's the inequitable impacts of climate change. Uh, and so that's sort of a core fight. So um, thanks for the intro. Thanks for all of the organizers for putting this together. Um, Adrian, Gareth, Hannah, for um, all of the um, organizing. I know, I know, I know how much work goes into these kinds of things, so I really um, appreciate that. And thanks to Madhu as well. It's just really humbling um, to come and speak uh, after you. I do want to apologize to everyone. I have a cold, so there's this fog between us, whether it's the cold. It's not jet lag. It's a cold, so it's either the cold or it's the medication or the combination of the both of the both, see, there it is right there. Um, so um, I'm gonna actually uh, probably read more than I normally do, uh, which I apologize for, but I'll try and stay on track. So I wanna do two things in this talk uh, on environmental justice and what I call sustainable materialism. So this whole idea of sustainable materialism, this whole book project on, on sustainable materialism was supposed to be a step away from environmental justice. I wanna do something a little different. Um, and yet when we started doing interviews with activists in food movements and community energy movements and sustainable fashion, justice came up almost every time. So this quickly became another yet different sort of project um, in uh, environmental justice. So I want to do two things. So one is to show how the discourse of environmental justice has infiltrated movements that aren't traditional environmental justice movements. This was a little surprising um, to me. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I want to explore as well a potential and particular kind of bridge between sustainable materialist movements and back to environmental justice. So one of the things I'll get at is the notions of justice in these sustainable materialist movements are a little bit different from what we would see in, in environmental justice movements. There are different different foci, uh, and I'm just not sure if the concept of environmental justice broadly is a bridging discourse for these kinds of movements. It might. Um, what I'm arguing here, and please argue back, this is brand new, uh, what I'm arguing here in particular is that a particular idea of participation, a material idea of participation, an, an embodied participation might be a better type of connection uh, between these two kinds uh, of movements. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's a new argument. I'm interested in discussion and feedback, especially at those, and this is not my, I'm a political theorist. I'm not a development specialist, right? So I'm particularly interested in, in, this, uh, in this concept of material participation as people in development studies, uh, NEJ, see it. So in response to the theme of the conference, which is on transformative connections, there are these two parts Right. What does environmental justice look like in sustainable materialist movements and what kind 
um, of what can material participation do to connect back um, to EJ. So to start, there's the book. It's out on the 1st of August. Um, it's been a lot of fun to work on this for the last few years. Uh, so um, the premise is about a different set of movements, people, groups, um, who are focusing on environmental practices. This comes out of a frustration uh, with a lack of action in the political sphere. Almost all of my interviews in the UK started with the line, after Copenhagen. Right? After Copenhagen, I just wanted to do something. And there's the shift um, to practice activism, food movements, community energy, sustainable fashion. The, the book covers uh, movements in the US, UK, and Australia. Um, so it's very Western, it's very Northern, it's very white. And you can come back to me on that. Um, the central research question of the book is, what motivates people? Why are people interested in this kind uh, of activity? And one of the things I just want to say is um, that the project, and I won't talk a lot about the project as a whole, but one of the things I do want to make clear is that it's not focused on individual ethical or consumer action. The focus is on movements. The focus is on collective action and self-identified movements. So we're looking at folks that are involved in recreating food systems, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. New relationships between production and consumption. Um, community energy also is not simply about individual homeowners slapping um, solar panels on their roofs. It's about neighborhood solar, cooperative solar, community energy, and broader just transition movements. And then in sustainable fashion, it's more than just about, and we didn't talk to consumers, we talked to, we talked to producers and those that were interested uh, in the entire supply chain um, from where something is grown, the conditions on the ground, the conditions to biodiversity, up through um, various factories, production, packing facilities, and then the whole fast fashion question. So there's a whole focus on the, the supply chain as a whole, and it's really about collective action for change. So there's a lot to the book that I'm not going to talk about. What I will talk about is the concepts of justice in these movements, which, like I said, surprised me. So I co-authored a piece a few years ago on sustainable materialism. It was in a political theory journal, so nobody's probably seen it. Um, but um, in that piece, there was a framework, but it didn't include justice. And that's because that was a theoretical piece that was done before we actually started talking to people. Uh, and as soon as we started talking to people, like I said, justice comes up again and again. So there are some similarities, um, but a lot of differences between, between what these movements call environmental justice and what we've come to expect from environmental justice movements, um, even environmental justice movements in the North. And so the quick takeaway really is that when people talk about um, social justice and environmental justice in these movements, which they do a lot, the focus is on three different things. One is on the importance of responding to power, and I'll talk about that a bit. Um, one is on addressing a basic set of capabilities or needs, including health, which came up in a conversation this morning. Um, I'll just talk very briefly about that. And then the crucial nature of both political and material participation. I'll talk about that at length. So one of the key things that comes out um, in the social justice and in environmental justice discourse of these movements um, is this relationship between justice and power. And here I'm sort of encourage that there's some sort of interesting overlap with issues raised in more critical environmental justice studies, the kind of stuff that David Pellow and Laura Polito have been writing about. But the articulation is a little bit different. So for a lot of the interviewees, social justice requires not just a critique of existing power, it's not just about discourse, <clears throat> but it's about the development of new forms and new circulations uh, of power. So members of food groups, for example, talk a lot about the movements as a response to and a removal from um, the industrialization and the alienation of food systems. Um, alternative energy groups see the same sort of thing in terms of creating an energy system that's distinct from, separate from, and a threat to fossil fuel-based energy systems. And we find the same thing in, in sustainable fashion. And for me, it, this is a way of consciously responding to a type of circulatory power and reproductive power. Uh, it's in a very Foucauldian way, and I apologize, that's the only time I'll use that word. Um, activists are motivated, really, by seeing themselves, seeing their bodies and their practices as replicating and participating in systems of power. And there's a desire to move out of those, physically remove their bodies and their communities from those flows of power and replace practices and circulations of power 
um, that separate us from the creation and sharing of basic everyday needs. So they insert movements, individuals, collectives into an interruption of power flows of industrialized food, destructive fossil fuels, and sweatshop disposable fashion. Um, so it really is about the construction of new modes, new circulations, new institutions of power and replacing those. But I do want to emphasize this, because it'll come back, this idea that people feel power as embodied, and they want to physically replicate a different system of relationships with each other, with particular material goods, um, and with communities. So the work of these groups, <clears throat> sorry, is a kind of counter power. I never do this when I talk, but this shows you how sick I am. Um, so groups, and you know, I'm not trying to get too grandiose here. People understand the small scale of their efforts. They certainly understand the power uh, of the industries that they're up against, but they just seek to step outside of those systems and to create something a little different. A just food system, a just energy system, a just supply chain. Um, for fashion. And there's other work that's going on in this realm that um, we can talk about. There are some direct links to practices of environmental justice movements here, particularly around food justice, and we can talk uh, a bit uh, about this. Um, but there are examples in plenty of American cities of African Americans, for example, trying to create more inclusive, empowered food systems outside uh, of the supermarket system with culturally appropriate food. Um, owner-operated businesses um, by the local community, um, businesses that, that counter to community needs, that cater, sorry, to community needs. So clearly the idea is to be a counter power. Um, and like I said, there's a real embodied materiality to that. <clears throat> so that's one notion of justice. Another notion of justice, and I'll just do this really quickly, um, is around um, capabilities and basic needs. And I guess this isn't surprising. People talk about their own functioning. They talk about the functioning of the communities. They talk about um, what uh, is needed. The main capabilities people talk about uh, are around individual and community health. And it's not just sort of health as in I'm sick. Um, it's health as in general well-being and the way that different sorts of systems can contribute to the well-being of individuals and communities. The other thing that comes up a lot, and for me is really important and sort of um, uh, replicated some of the earlier work that I had done, is that people talk about community itself as a basic need, community as something that is important, both for their own functioning, I need my community in order um, for, for my own self to develop, but communities as the subject of justice as well, right? That the community is, uh, uh, is a really important focus. So there's a lot of, um, of this, and again, we can talk more about that. I'm rushing because I want to get to the, um, the other stuff. But I think um, one of the things that surprised me a lot in this, just as an aside, is how much you'd think environmental justice and food justice movements would be really concerned about health. Um, but there are a lot of food movements that don't really talk about worker health. They talk about their own health, and they talk about community health and, and healthy food in a community. But it's wild to me how they often forget the workers um, and the farm, the farm workers. Maybe that's just an American thing. It was certainly the same thing in, in Australia. And one of the things that surprised me about sustainable fashion was how much the focus was on the workers, workers in the fields, workers in the factories. Um, and that really blew me away about sustainable fashion, that whole, that attentiveness um, to health and well-being um, in the workplace. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so, and then the last notion of justice, the third notion of justice that people talk about quite a bit um, is um, around participation and procedural justice. And again, as I said in the beginning, one of the key findings for me is that people, people articulate participation in very material ways. We hear groups um, repeatedly emphasize the importance of increasing community involvement in the production of food, in the production uh, of energy. So it's not only about classic political participation and inclusion uh, in decision making, though it does include that, I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's also about this insistence on a sense of material participation or social inclusion in everyday practices. And this really gets to the core of this materialist aspects of this politics. So a truly just 
just form of political participation for these movements is not simply about voting or being consulted. It's about doing. And this idea of do activism is what people repeated uh, again uh, and again. And it's that mix of the political and the material for me that makes these movements unique, and it's why I call them sustainable materialist. So one of the questions for this kind of group is um, how critical is this kind of environmental justice? Uh, how, how much is this really environmental justice? How much is it social justice? How much is it connected or possibly connected um, with other environmental justice uh, groups? I think the thing that surprised me about these conversations with people is just how little equity came up. Um, there's just, there's, uh, just doing a word search through 100 interviews, this just doesn't happen. And I don't know if that's because people automatically equate equity with justice, and so it's there, but it's not there in that um, particular term. Fairness comes up a bit. But the other thing that doesn't come up, um, and probably more obviously, is recognition. Um, and that is more telling. I think that illustrates what we know about these movements. They're primarily white. They're not struggling on a daily basis with racism, with non-recognition, with misrecognition, with malrecognition. Um, that's not always the case, clearly. As I mentioned, African-American food justice movements illustrate that kind of recognition. There is that intersection, um, but there's very little of that in other movements. So, I mean, my takeaway on the notions of justice in these movements is that while they may be critical and innovative in some ways, they clearly fall short of articulating the kind of intersectional, critical environmental justice that someone like David Pella or Laura Polito uh, has offered. So we hear a lot of talk about power, but nothing on race outside of the African-American groups that do talk about Black Lives Matter, for example. Um, nothing explicit on feminism or gender, nothing on state violence, nothing on colonization, um, or recognizing complicity in settler colonialism, not even in Australia where this is uh, a huge issue. Um, not much talk about species interdependence, or there is actually a lot of talk about um, reconnecting with the non-human. There's much more of that than there is about race, which is a concerning issue um, for a number of reasons. But these are primarily white movements and privileged movements. Um, so we're sort of left without a real disconnect between the necessity and importance of a critical EJ on the one hand, um, and in the way that the term and the conception and the discourse of environmental justice is being used on the ground. And that's a little disturbing um, to me, and let's talk a bit, a, bit, a bit more about that. But part two, material participation. So I want to expand a little bit about this because I think this is an area uh, where there are some useful connections. So I want to make three points in this second section. I want to describe um, material participation um, and differentiate what I'm talking about, because I'm not the first one to talk about material participation. There's quite a bit uh, out there, um, which I was surprised to learn. So I want to talk about uh, this particular kind that I'm thinking about. I want to emphasize how the material participation in these movements is focused on making connections and working sustainably with the non-human realm. Um, material participation for these movements is about sustainability in practice. Uh, and I think that's crucial. Um, and then third, I want to argue against, and I don't think I'll hear it in this room, I've heard it in other rooms, um, there are people who say that material participation is not political, right? Um, and I'll come back um, to that, that it's post-political or apolitical. Um, and I think that's just a very, a very naive critique that comes from a very limited notion uh, of what the political actually is and what, uh, what is possible um, in terms of building movements around material participation. So that's what I do in this section. <clears throat> First bit, political participation and procedural justice are key demands of environmental justice movements and sustainable materialist movements. This is one of these places of overlap. And procedural justice is clearly key in itself in terms of democratic legitimacy, in terms of just outcomes, in terms of, uh, of more fair distributions, right? being impacted by political decisions without having a say, especially in decisions that lead to environmental bads in one commu one's community, this has long been a focus uh, of justice uh, in environmental justice movements. And for sustainable materialist movements, it's also about the real lack of action in this more traditional realm that motivates people, there's a dissolution 
with the authenticity of the political realm. Right? Traditional political participation, lobbying, uh, just doesn't work anymore. And rather than, than critique exclusion, which is what I think most environmental justice movements do, just the lack of access, um, because these are primarily white movements that do have access, the critique is about authenticity and lack of, uh, of authentic response. And I think because there's that lack of faith in the political system, this sort of moving away from the state, um, there's a focus on increasing community involvement um, in the production of new systems of food and energy uh, and fashion. So we usually understand political participation as an instrumental action, right? You protest to get a message across, you lobby to change policy, you vote for an outcome. Um, but what we found in interviews um, is an understanding of politics and justice and sustainability that's about material action as a process, material action um, as an embodiment of change uh, in a system about the embodiment of a different flow of things through everyday life. And for people, this is incredibly politically empowering. And that insistence on material participation um, really is about political participation and procedural justice and action for sustainability in very material ways. Again, it's about community involvement in the production uh, of basic needs. It's about doing. So there is some other work that's going on here, and I do want to acknowledge a lot of the work on material politics, feminist new materialisms like Cool and Frost work, vitality and other kinds of materialisms like Jane Bennett and Gay Hawkins have offered. There's a more technical approach um, by Morris, um, and which is about sort of a, the participation of things um, and objects. All of this work, I am appreciative of because it helps to legitimize the study of the material realm um, in the study uh, of politics. Um, but I think it's important to recognize, and Lisa Dish has this great es essay uh, on non-human representation who argues that we need to be a bit more critical of the, of the more tech-centric ideas, the smart city and inclusion in smart city, right? the interaction between human and non-human things, um, as it misses that sort of crucial aspect of political motivation and action and organizing. And I make a very similar sort of argument in the, the book that's coming out. Mm -hmm. So material participation is more than thing power, which is what Bennett is famous for. It's about political power and participation uh, in the human realm as well and between humans. So I'm really interested in the way that activists articulate their material political action, the way that it's become part of an understanding of procedural justice. I'm interested in how that participation is articulated as, as a form of sustainability within everyday life. Um, I like that activists are talking about the vitality of humans and non-humans alike um, as they design and they shift systems uh, and material flows. And that gets to the second point, which is really about that sort of form of material participation um, and sustainability being very um, related and intersecting. And one of the things that we found in these movements is not just attention to systems of flows of materials, but a lot of attention to how that connects to the non-human and the flow of materials and the development of systems that take account of material flows out of the non-human realm through human communities and back uh, into the non-human realm uh, as well. So there's a focus on visibility and reconnection uh, to material flows. So reconnecting people to the natural world, quote, um, is a focus of material participation. Now, we get a lot of this attention in the traditional environmental justice movement. Um, again, I'm informed by a lot of work that's been going on about material impacts on human systems and health, pollutions, toxins in the bloodstream, lead poisoning, the work um, of Giovanna Di Chiro, uh, and um, this is where, this is Tina Gabrielson, a close colleague and friend whose name is sort of somewhere in the fog there. Sorry, Tina. Um, so there is a lot of this sort of focus on materiality in environmental justice movements uh, and the flow of materials through the body. My first exposure to environmental justice organizing was in the Silicon Valley of California um, where EJ was being used around worker health um, in silicon chip manufacturing plants um, and women having miscarriages and being poisoned. So that whole idea of, of materials that flow through the body has been key 
um, to environmental justice from the beginning. So my final point is about the politics of all this, and maybe I can skip a bit about this because this is just me bitching about other people bitching about me. Um, but it's really, um, there are some academic critics out there who don't think that a focus on materiality will improve actual practice. Um, there are those who say that a new materialism runs the risk of producing a politics that doesn't matter. Um, Inglefor Bluthorn has critiqued um, the work that I'm doing as just another example of the politics of unsustainability, that these movements are about coping and not really about countering. Um, and I just completely disagree um, with, um, with Inglefor and Eric Swingedow has made the same sort of point um, that, I mean, really the only kind of politics is mass protests in the street against capital. And yes, that is politics, um, but creating a new food system to remove oneself from the monopoly of a supermarket chain in your city is to me a form of politics. And for those who can't see that, I, I just don't understand that. Um, so I'll just leave it uh, at that. But sure, throw another set of criticisms at me. And then <clears throat> I just want to finish um, with some questions about the viability of this kind of material participation as a broader link to, to EJ movements. Again, this is, you know, I've just, I'm just articulating this for you. I haven't written this out. I'm just thinking about this idea of connectivity and transformation, which is the theme uh, of the conference. Uh, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out ways that this project that I have just finished and going back into environmental justice, what, what are the links, what, um, what are the connections there? Um, clearly, environmental justice has been about resistance and conflict, the EJ Atlas, which we'll talk about, um, lays out one conflict after another, right? Community resistance um, to resource extraction, resource production that does ill to local communities. But there have been, there have always been parts of the EJ movement that have been simultaneously reconstructive. And I, I think that, you know, the Indian forest example is exactly an example of that opposition that comes with alternatives. Critiques of the impacts of energy industry have always come with inclusive models for more sustainable local economies uh, and more sustainable development. Critiques of the impacts of the growth of industrialized food systems on subsistence communities have always come with models and practices of food sovereignty uh, and local control. Critiques of the infusion of chemicals on the bodies of residents and workers from communities to farms to factories have always come with a focus on material alternatives, non-toxic material flows uh, in the fashion industry. So the question really is about whether this focus on sustainable materialism and material participation might be a more direct route to this connectivity and transformation than this sort of broad discourse of environmental justice. I don't know the answer to that, but that's the, the question that I'm posing. Okay, so what did I just say? Three points about overlaps um, between sustainable materialism and, and EJ movements on justice. Justice is about opposing power. Justice is about functioning individuals and communities. Justice is about political and material participation. And then three points about material participation itself, um, that it is a form of embodied political participation. Um, it's an embodied and practiced form of sustainability. And it is a deliberate and I think effective, <laughs> effective political act. Um, now, with those six points, I also see quite a bit of disconnect between the discourses of environmental justice and sustainable materialism, but some potential for some overlap, alliances, collaborations, connections between these movements in the realm of material participation. And that's what I'd be really happy to talk about in Q&A. That's it. We have about 25 minutes left. And we're going to give Madhu and David the chance to address some of those issues that you were raising for us, uh, David, in the end. Exploring the links and connections and complementarities or tensions between both of your presentations. And so we'll give you the chance to ask each other a question about how you view the links or not between your normal presentations. And then we'll open the floor for the... First we'll have a round of questions from the public and then we'll bring in people that are uh, far away. Yes. <laughs> No, you, you first, go right ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure I have a question because I'm still trying to understand the links. Yeah, sorry, that's my, my theory <laughs> background. Um, 
Well, I think, I mean, the, the question I'd have for you is, uh, I mean, in, in your talk, you're talking about the difference, and in our conversation earlier, you're talking about the difference between an industrialized form of forest production and a relational form of, of forest sustainability and use, right? And there seems to be much more of that kind of attention to an interest in um, not just the political power, but in having a resource and the responsibility um, for, for using that as, as part of the politics. Does that make sense? See, I'm talking through a fog. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I think what, at least my focus was on how customary lands are being appropriated and yeah. put to other uses and the environmental justice <laughs> dimensions of that. Um, Maybe just hold it closer. Is it on? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, so it's more a question of uh, appropriating, you know, grabbing yeah. customary lands yeah. for, you know, by simply calling them something else and actually changing their use and uh, character yeah. rather than than anything else, and, and it's, the movement has been to try and restore control back to communities. Yeah. And to some extent, it's, it's working. Not fully, of course, but it has, in some pockets, it's done very well. So we can move to questions from the audience. Maybe yep. <coughs> Do we only have this microphone for the public? Or? Yes. So we'll open a round of, com of questions and comment, per questions preferably from people from the, from the audience. And then we'll, Tina will maybe help us with three people from, from the Twitter or the other system. Anybody want to have a comment, explore these connections between the two presentations? Yes. Um, hi, good morning. Mladen Domazet of the Institute for Political Ecology. I have a question more than a connection to the two presentations. It seems a hard task. Uh, it's still early for me in the morning. Um, I was wondering if David could tell us more about the absence or presence of criticism of growth ideology uh, in the communities that he was working with. Um, is it as absent as race and understanding of other minorities? And I was wondering if David's also aware of the work of Petri Jehlička on the food self-provisioning in Eastern Europe as a form of resistance throughout the sort of second half of the 20th century and continuing today as well. Uh, now the answer to the second question is no, and this is one of the things for the future for me is to make connections with the same sorts of uh, and previous um, notions of this idea of sustainable materialism. I mean, I, I, and we say in the beginning of the book, none of this is new, none of this is, is, um, is new to the world, it's new to some of these communities. Um, but it is a form of resistance, right? So, but in answer to the first, yeah, I think, uh, I don't talk about the, in the book we don't talk about the critique of growth. It's, um, it's because it's, it's there, but it's less of a political motivation Right, so the focus of the book is on, is on the political motivations of these actors. And it's more for them, at least for these activists that we interviewed, it's more about taking power back and, uh, and modeling different systems of providing basic needs than it is about degrowth. Now clearly there's a critique of growth and a critique of monopolistic growth. There. It's more about, we hear more about monopolies and we hear more about corrupt capital than about a growth ideology. But I think one of the other ways of answering that question is a lot of the people that we talk to, a lot of the businesses that we talk to, were not interested in growing, right? They didn't want to be bigger. They wanted to have a model that others could replicate, right? It's a form of prefigurative politics. So that 
So, so they don't really embody that, that idea of growth, not even in the fashion industry, which was surprising to me. It's, you know, we, we want to set a model that other people can use. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much to both the presenters for your fantastic presentations. Um, I'm Alexandra Tomazelli from Eurac Research Italy. And I have as well more a question rather than a point of connection between the two papers. And it's mainly mm, addressed to David uh, regards um, uh, whether, I mean, uh, perhaps quite technical because you were saying during your presentation that some concepts were missing from the interviews and about recognition and race, also gender issues, etc. And I was wondering, particularly with regard to USA and Australia, whether, although these movements are white and uh, privileged, etc., whether they were referring to Aboriginal indigenous peoples or not, and that perhaps could be in their movements, like I Don't Know More in Canada, the Dakota Pipeline in USA, etc. Is there something there? Because I Don't Know More, for example, was <coughs> identified as one of the first environmental indigenous and non-indigenous movement, for example. So I was wondering whether you observed something there. Uh, or did they refer to that, or are they aware of that, and, and so on and so forth. Thank you. So I, I have to think about that, but I, I, I mean, immediately my thought is that the only ones that we interviewed that did talk about First Nations were First Nations businesses um, or activists. Right? I, 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 don't, I, can't, I don't know if that's the case, but I, that's my sense. And, um, and this is why I said, you know, there's, there is very little around these, you know, these absolutely necessary notions of a more critical EJ um, that does look at these intersectional questions. And, and again, I, you know, I didn't go into this wanting to criticize the environmental justice notions of these communities and, and these movements. Um, but I do, <laughs> um, but that's not really the focus. I mean, the focus really is on, on what they're doing and what their motivations are. Um, I didn't really start thinking about that until we were going through and, and we're just really surprised at the lack uh, of some. And <clears throat> that may be more, you know, that may be more about the questions and the conversation and we were engaging them in what they were doing um, and why they were doing it more than the larger critique. So I, I don't want to be unfair to those that we were questioning. Um, but uh, that said, there are some notions of justice that came up and others that didn't. Right. So I'll, I'll have, I have two questions here from Madhu. And then, and then there's one, one person there, another lady there. And we'll, we'll give you a chance and then we'll see how we go. So Madhu, um, some people from afar, I think people, Adrian, is that you, Adrian? Uh, I'm not very far huh? away, no. Is that you? <laughs> so there's an Adrian that's close, close by, sorry. Shouldn't give you a chance, but anyway. Adrian is asking, do you consider bicultural as an important alternative conceptualization for forest native conservation, the, con the concept of bio bicultural? And the, the other one from anonymous, <laughs> person from far away. How effective is the village assembly at recognizing and distributing rights to the forest in real life? These two questions for Madhu. Um, I think uh, definitely, you know, for a lot of the communities which are now asserting to reclaim their rights, you know, if they have been denied through their customary resources. Um, uh, the biocultural you know, pro dimension is critical. I mean, they want to uh, protect its, their biocultural uh, heritage, in fact, both livelihoods, culture, lifestyle, everything. Uh, it's not just you know, land or resources uh, per se. 
Um, and the second question was? How effective is the community assembly in reducing yeah, violence? Well, <coughs> I think in that, uh, you know, there's a, there are a whole lot of questions uh, because there's a lot of uh, variation. Uh, you can have homogeneous communities where it's a lot easier uh, for the village assembly to function. You can have very uh, disparate communities where, in fact, certainly, you know, if the majority in a community is not dependent on the forest and the, the weakest members are the most dependent, uh, they can be serious problem of the better off or the more powerful preventing the weaker to actually utilize uh, their customary resources in the way they've always used. But what we found is that by and large so far in uh, the majority of cases where uh, community rights have been recognized, um, they have worked pretty well. Uh, there is, there is a, a particular cluster in Maharashtra where uh, some amazing uh, you know, feedback is coming of how communities are functioning. Uh, you know, in a very coherent way to manage their forest, devise new rules. Uh, equity seems to be uh, an important consideration. Uh, similarly in Gujarat, you know, a number of communities have got bamboo uh, which had flowered and which was dying and so they were able to sell that and with that money now, they are uh, regenerating and they are equitably distributing some of the benefit amongst the community. So there are variations definitely and I'm sure there will be many problems. It's uh, one cannot say, you know, with the sort of diversity uh, we have both cultural, economic, uh, you know, um, indigenous versus non-indigenous and the whole lot, there will be problems in a country like India. But uh, on the whole, in forest-dependent communities, it, so far it seems to be working reasonably well. So um, I've lost the person. Oh, there you go. And then. Um, Salaheta Ramchali Swaminen from Luke, Finland. Uh, I have a question to both, uh, both keynote speakers. First to Mata Sarin. Um, in, my, uh, in the country where I'm working, uh, where I've been recently working, Laos, uh, I noticed a lot of differences depending on ethnicity. So within the community and between different communities, uh, so whether you're a local Lao or Hmong or so on, there is a tremendous difference in how these um, people are uh, able to um, to profit, bear risks and benefits. In your presentation, you were uh, talking about communities as a rather homogeneous, uh, uh, you know, entity. I wonder um, um, if you can elaborate about the differences that you have be, that you have uh, noticed uh, about the abilities of these communities to really uh, benefit or to. I, I wrote it somewhere, <laughs> but I think you know what I'm getting at. Um, so if you can er elaborate on the <laughs> caste system and the heterogeneity of communities, so the differences based on the cultural differentiation and how those influence the abilities of forest dwellers to, to benefit or to be um, affected negatively. Sorry, that went long. Um, second question is to, uh, to David. Um, and that one is about your first point about power. Um, oh, sorry, about justice as opposing power. So you were talking about justice as a counter power and counter circulations, which I interpreted as a counter conduct in the Foucault's work. Sorry to mention that again. <laughs> and um, how to ensure that uh, justice as opposing power or counter conduct um, can indeed bring for changing the current power flows when the same emerges within the same power system and flow, right? So maybe what we are seeing with the sustainable uh, materialism, that's exactly it. I mean, it's a, does it really shake the power so it's just, you know, kind of reinforced the, the same and how we can exit from this uh, 
um, circle. Thank you. Um, I think, um, see, as of now, we've uh, had uh, claims to community rights from some areas. <coughs> it's not across the board. There are certain areas from where uh, communities are actually not claiming those rights. And I think that's partly because, uh, you know, the, because of the nature of communities. A lot of them do not want to take on the responsibility of managing the forest because they're no longer that dependent on it. The economy has changed. Uh, you have states like Himachal, et cetera. I mean, you know, people have rights, they, they get timber when they need, the forest department provides, they don't want the headache. So we don't have those problems in those areas of you know, unequal or uh, uh, communities, how that function. The areas where, like in fact, all the examples that I showed are of homogeneous communities and where it seems to be working much better because they're, they're either all 100% uh, per indigenous or 100% pastoral uh, and that protest which is going on, that's all indigenous communities. So th they have a very strong common identity and a common interest. Uh, we've not, we've not, I, I'm sure as I said, there will be problems in, in, you know, where there is inequality within communities, but these have not surfaced on a big, uh, in a major way as of now, uh, partly because you know, recognition of rights has been quite uneven and even claims. And I've noticed that, as I said, in some areas, people just don't want to claim. Yeah, well, we don't want the headache, you know, where uh, the forest department is managing, they are no longer that dependent and whatever little they need, they get. So why should they take on the headache of, uh, you know, daily thing? So that's the way it is that as I see it. Yeah, on the, on the change and power question, so this comes up a bit. So the question is, is removing oneself and one's community and, and sort of you know, creating this alternative flow of goods, is that really a counter power or is it just a way, as, as Inglefer has said, as a way of coping um, while letting that power continue? And I, I think that's, that's a better way of asking the question than, oh, these movements aren't political. Because I, I think the, the prefigurative part of this is really important. And I think one of the key things is people feeling confident that this is a system that they are building that can be replicated to replace larger industrial systems. Certainly in community energy and community food, we hear a lot of that. In sustainable fashion, it really is more about demonstrating how, you know, how we can make clothes and circulate clothes in much more sustainable and just ways. So I think it's, it's, it's less about that sort of direct fight against power and more about the creating of an alternative which illustrates what can be done. And that prefigurative politics is really crucial. Uh, I mean, the, I think the, the more surprising thing to me was the way that people saw this as an integral part of their notion of justice, right? That they, they felt as though they did not want their bodies or their community's bodies to be replicating power structures because that created injustices in people's lives. Uh, and so that, that removal um, at least stops that part of the replication and people thought that was a really important statement um, to make uh, to only support the creation of and the circulation of, go of goods that were created in just ways. So do you want to take the microphone there? But while you do that, I'll ask two more questions from, I don't know if it's the public or the, or the audience is so far away. Um, David from Rod. Um, what is your assessment of how the notions of degrowth were represented in the material sustainability movements? Yep. And to Madhu, um, 
Are the Adivasi with forest rights bound by existing national environmental laws, or do their forest resource management rights overrule these? Do the new, do the new forest laws um, override the national ones? So I think I answered the degrowth one before. I, I was surprised at how little the concept came up uh, in these movements. And I don't know why that is, but it didn't, the, the, that sort of idea of degrowth didn't come up. Certainly critiques of growth and unsustainable development and, and all of that came up, but, but uh, as far as ties to this discourse of degrowth, not so much. Um, I think this is a slightly gray area in terms of uh, to what extent, for example, community rights, once they are recognized, to what extent they overrule existing laws. I don't think they do. Uh, they do, you know, what, what is happening is that authority is transferred from the forest department to communities in management. And uh, overall, they are expected to conform, you know, to certainly to some of the laws, like they can certainly not, uh, you know, convert forest to non-forest use. Uh, that would really uh, be almost uh, considered a crime. Um, uh, it's just in the management, there could be issues, that, but they haven't yet come up in terms of, you know, any major conflicts. They don't, they don't really overrule them. The, the FRA does not overrule the existing laws, but it does, it does overrule to the extent that instead of the forest department having monopoly controls, a lot of those controls have been transferred to communities, or some of them anyway. Can I, can I just briefly follow up yeah. just with that? Which, just this question about, so clearly the, the, the forestry industry, uh, the forestry, um, uh, that um, um, ministry sees no benefit, right, and actually sees harm to themselves in this. But what, what about, what, what is the benefit that other agencies, other ministries see uh, in more authentic community control over forests? Why is there that support in other parts of the government? Um, see, it's lively, like we now ended up with two ministries involved. There's the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Uh, the mandate of which actually is to protect rights. And there's a Ministry of Environment and Forest, which talks about protecting the environment. Uh, they, you know, profess no accountability to, to communities as such. So what we have is now, there is actually a lot of tension between the two ministries. <laughs> One is challenging the other. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, how both of them interpret the law uh, as far as Ministry of Tribal Affairs is concerned, they are saying no, it's their right, their livelihoods, their culture, whereas uh, the other ministry is talking about environment and forests and wildlife. Uh, so, you know, how the two come together. Right. I guess.